Gerald McRaney, uh, the whole country, the whole world has now seen Deadwood, the movie, reuniting all of you after a dozen years or so. Yeah. Is uh, George Hurst the most evil person you've ever played? No, I don't think so. I think probably the most evil person I've ever played was a, um, a guy that was drawn absolutely from reality, a guy named Chris Wilder, who tortured and killed young women across the country. And that was a pretty evil son of a bitch. But George Hurst is up there. When you're playing somebody like that, let's say George Hurst in this instance, do you have to get into the mindset? Cause he's not thinking he's evil. He's no, thinking no, he's, he's doing everything for a purpose and, yeah. and, and that he's a good he's guy. He's progress. And right. people keep getting in the way. Is, does you, do you have to find those, those things within that person? Yeah, I think that's uh, one of the most important things that separates you know, uh, drama from melodrama is uh, if you're doing a drama and you're tasked with playing a villain, you can't play him villainously. You have to find all the things that justify what it is that he's doing and, and concentrate on that. And, you know, eliminate any of the stuff that might look evil and just play the actions. Well, hardly anybody thinks of themselves as bad. No, I'm convinced Adolf Hitler thought he was doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. In his mind, he was. What did you think when you got this script? And you're not only making, a, I mean, I, it could have been a cameo. It could have been yeah. uh, just a, let's make sure we get Daryl McGraney in here for a few minutes. You're almost a co-lead in this. Yeah, it was fantastic. I, uh, it's interesting. It's like five years ago, something like that. Uh, David approached me and he was working on what was a completely different script at that particular moment in time. And by the time it all evolved, it was totally changed, but he wanted me in there from the beginning. But I had no idea it was going to be as involved as it wound up being. But um, I think David just saw the Hearst character as that um, violent agent of change that was happening not only to Deadwood, but to the country and, and in fact, the world at that time. You know, it was already being dragged into the 20th century, even in the 1880s and 90s. It was, that was already occurring with uh, telephones and um, you know, the automobiles mm -hmm. were not far behind. And um, there was a lot of radical change going on in the world. And of course, that was the death knell of the Old West. You are the future. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I want to ask you about some of the actors you work with in, in the past and now in the present. Um, and we just interviewed Timothy a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. He said he was so, he said you are a, we're talking about you, he said you are a true pro uh, at all times and he can't give a higher compliment than that. That, no, so that an no, actor is a Timothy true pro. is too and he's no nonsense and we, I mean he's an incredible artist but uh, there's nothing arty about him. He just, he does the work and he does it extremely well. But he comes to work, he comes prepared every day. Um, you know, when they say ready first team, Tim's the first one on the set, or the second if I'm there. <laughs> um, but he's that kind of actor, and I just adore working with him. And I've worked with him on several other series. He that was talking had. about he, that. Yeah. He always puts you through the ringer too. Yes, he does, <laughs> he just tortures me. You know? And we were doing the scene where he finally takes Hearst to jail, and once we're inside the thing, um, I've got some smart ass line to him, and he's supposed to just shove me into a cell. And I said to him, Tim, grab me by the ear again. <laughs> He's, oh, the, of course. You, you were on vacation, and you couldn't be at the premiere, but the room just erupted when they grabbed you by the ear. Ah. Because it's a callback. Cool. Oh, yeah. There's so yes, many absolutely. callbacks in this yeah. to prior um, to prior episodes and prior seasons. Yeah. Uh, well, he said to apologize to you when I told him we would be speaking in the near future just for all they put you through in the street scene. <laughs> <laughs> that was brutal. It really was because it was cold out there and I was wet for the entire night. Wet that and was muddy. And... Yeah. And, you know. Doing those stunts is not as easy at 72 as it was at 32. No. Well, the thing about this particular uh, the show as well as the movie is, in, in your case, George Hurst, he has a real life. He actually does 
you know, go on to do the things that he goes on to do, and he dies at a particular point, so they can't kill you. No, no. Like, like they might on another antagonist well, on another show. that's the one thing I knew about the fight scene is I was going to survive it, you know. But the public, I think the audience needed the catharsis of seeing you beaten to, yes, to, a, yes. to a bloody pulp. Yeah. People need to see the George Hursts of the world get their ass kicked. Yeah. And they did on this one. And speaking of cameos, there's a little surprise cameo from uh, Garrett. Uh, Hedlund? Uh, no, Hedlund. Uh, Dillon. Dillon. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Who can do anything. Right. I said when he was playing Hearst's assistant, and he had already played uh, the guy who assassinated uh, Bill Hickok, I said the next thing they're going to be Garrett back and he's going to be playing one of the whores in the gym. Because <laughs> uh, he can do anything. That was so really smart can. to bring him in. And people, I didn't even notice, but at the party afterwards, people said, did you notice that was Garrett? And I said, no, so I had to go back and take another quick look because yeah. they were so well disguised. I, I, Ian McShane and you had some, some fierce uh, dialogue sessions over the years. Yes, indeed. And it's, it's such a joy. One of the things I like best about Ian is that he will try anything. He's game for anything. He'll get a take done perfectly. And David then might suggest, let's do it a completely different way. Certainly, let's do that. Let's try it. Sounds good. And he's just, he's totally amenable to damn near anything that you might suggest, especially if it came from David. Right. Uh, because he trusts him so implicitly. We all do. Yeah. Ian's been, uh, he's played every nationality, I think you can imagine, under the sun when I've seen him in guest roles and other movies and yeah. things over the years. He's yeah. very talented. I remember him from uh, Lovejoy. That was, yeah. I was a fan of that show yeah. back in the day. I remember seeing him on West Wing once. He was, a, I think, a Russian uh, uh, person that came in to negotiate something mm -hmm. within the offices. And I wasn't going to bring this up till later, but that's one of my favorite guest spots you ever did. Well, the thing on uh, West Wing. Uh, yeah, I love that. I, I, one of my favorite lines of all times when somebody mentioned war crimes, and the, the, my character, the general, was like, all wars are crimes. It's, and you and John Spencer, that's a team right oh, there. Oh, man. Yeah. Hey, we lost him. Lost a great so talking one. about pros. Yes, indeed. And uh, that same approach. I'll tell this as fast as I can. I interviewed Kristen Chenoweth once, and she said the week after he died, or the, the next episode they did after he died, uh, she needed to be, uh, there was a cold room, as all the studio sets are, mm -hmm. and they gave her a coat, which happened to be the coat he had worn in his last episode that he mm -hmm. shot and it was filled with the candies he always kept in his pocket still and um, so anyway that I always love West Wing and I, yeah. I, I never have asked you about that but that was a great episode it was I wish he had been a recurring experience. yeah yeah I do too another care uh, another actress I wanted to ask you about on Deadwood uh, that just knocks the roof off here is uh, Paula Malcolmson Yes. Uh, and, and it was nice to see her get such a meaty role, and yeah. you and she go at it a couple of times. Yeah, and I, God, I love working with her, even if it is, you know, 20 yards apart. But the scene that we had in the saloon, mm -hmm. I really loved working on that. You one. come in on the wedding. Yeah. At, right at yeah. the wedding's over. Yeah, and she was just delightful in that scene. Just wonderful. Trying her dead level best now to make peace and knowing that she's She's blown it, but please, for the sake of my baby, you know, and, and it just, no. he has no heart. None. <laughs> I want to ask about a scene that I talked to Timothy about. I, I talked to a couple of people at the party about the scene where you're on the roof, you've got the two guys beside you, and you've got the showdown with, uh, with uh, the marshal. Mm -hmm. I don't even know how you shot that and stayed so still. Uh, I mean, I know you knew what was coming, but still, I mean, it was just an amazing scene to watch. Well, one of the things is I'm a hunter and I go target shooting a lot, so the sound of gunfire doesn't startle me the way it does some actors. So even when the gunfire was going on, I could, you know, I was conditioned to it in a way, so uh, it was easy for me not to react to it, and I think that was the most important part of being still in that is not to react to all the violence that's spinning around Hearst. I wanted him to be the center of the violence, not a participant in it. 
Well, in, in the thing way. about it is, in terms of uh, if somebody had never even seen Deadwood, they get a really clear picture of George Hurst, I think, in that scene, in that you know now nothing phases him. Yeah. Nothing surprises him. Nothing phases him. He's in control. Well, my approach to it is he really doesn't have an emotional life. Hmm. He's, he's really all about finding ore. That's it. And the most efficient way of processing it. And apart from that, nothing. Incredibly intelligent guy. Yeah. Yeah. Instinctively so. Not, not schooled. But instinctively so. Another nice scene is you and Dayton Kelly uh, when you go to, to make the, the offer to him out on the river yeah. and the, on the land. Um, that but scene that's is so nice so because they let it breathe. Yes. We were allowed to take so much time with that scene. And there was so much left on camera of transitions being made and time being taken. And it helped. It played. And... Uh, you don't find a lot of directors with that kind of patience. And then editors who know exactly when to leave that shot and go to another one. When this one, all right, it's lived up until now, but now we gotta put the scissors in. Now we gotta cut to the other thing. It was extremely well done. You enjoyed working with Dayton? Yeah, I enjoy working. I was just gonna say I enjoy working with every actor on that set. Uh, it's, it's, I think the most, incredibly talented group of people I've ever been with. Uh, and you consider the size of that cast and not a dud in the whole bunch. I mean, everybody there is brilliant. Not just good. They're How they brilliant. got everybody together too. They're, because every, almost to a person, everybody's had such a good career since then. Well, yeah. They're all busy. But I tell you what, there's not a person there who isn't extremely grateful to David Milch for having created that show and brought us into that show. They found a way to get back. You, you find a way to get back for that man, yeah. What is it about him? And, and I wanted, I'll ask you the same thing I asked Timothy, see if you have a similar answer, but go ahead. Two things, um, his genius, obviously, but that's an easy one. The other thing is his kindness, his, his gentleness. He is, a, in the truest sense of that word, a gentle man. Um, they might not like my telling this, but uh, when I was working on the original show, it was the time of Hurricane Katrina, and I told him about a friend of mine who had lost his home in uh, New Orleans and was just living with a friend for the time being in Arkansas somewhere. And um, I had told him we'd been friends since we were in a rep company together in New Orleans. And David said, does he still act? He hasn't in years, but that's that's how we met. He said, "I tell you what, tell him to come out here. I've got some apartments that I keep for people uh, at Oakwood Apartments, and we'll find something for him to do." And he wrote a role for this guy who hadn't acted in 20 years, and put him up until he could get on his feet. And isn't that amazing? That's the kind of person David Milch is. Apart from that genius. There's that humanity that just, and I think the two go hand in hand with him. Um, his, his respect and his love for literature is just a reflection of his respect and his love for the human condition. I think he's going to win an Emmy this September. God, I hope so. Wouldn't that be amazing? Yeah, yeah. Um, what I asked Timothy that I wonder about you as well, see if you have a similar answer. When you have somebody, David Milch in this case, or anybody you've worked with, that's so specific of a writer, the rhythms, uh, you can't, I mean, every everything matters. Yeah. Is that harder as an actor or no, easier? No, no, it's much easier. It's much easier. Um, also, that first year, I, when we went on our Christmas break, I went by the writer's room before we left for our Christmas break to thank David and everybody who contributed to any of those scripts for writing such stuff as we actors could so totally trust that now we could just deal with the business of acting. We didn't have to think, is this scene working? Does this, will this play? Of course it will play. Now you just do your job and everything will be fine. Mm -hmm. uh, and 
that's a gift for an actor. Then when you get into such a specific use of language uh, from a specific time period and written in a particular cadence that way, it gives you your limits, your playground. This is where you are. Uh, and, and that's very grounding for an actor. Um, it's, no, it's just an incredible gift all the way around. Timothy said, so many jobs that any of you get, uh, he said, it's just like turning crap into mediocrity. Uh, and he yeah. said, so when, when, you, when, the, when the level of the work is already there, then yes. you get to really yeah, play. Well, that's what I'm saying. All I have to do is my job mm -hmm. now. I don't have to second guess a writer, a director. Any, no, those guys are pros. They know what they're doing. They're gifted artists. Now I just get to relax and do what it is that I've trained my whole life for and, and trust, you know. Uh, they're there to catch me in the air and there's a net under me. So <laughs> I'm perfectly safe doing whatever they ask me to do. The other actor I was going to ask you about, uh, who you had some great scenes with in the series, and really just one, re one really good one here, William Sanderson. Yeah. He makes everything he's ever been in better. He does. He does. And it, uh, Bill just has a gift. It's something in him. Uh, I, it's not so much acting training, although I'm sure he's done that, but there's just something about Bill himself. Uh, who takes, a, the characters. who takes a random walk-on role in Newhart and makes it an eight-year <laughs> makes it an eight-year role? Yeah, yeah. But even what he did that that role that he had in Coal Miner's Daughter. I remember that. Remember that? Mm -hmm. He was perfect. He was just spot on. I was just watching um, the client the other day with Susan Sarandon. He's yeah. great in that. Yes. Everything. Everything he does, he's great in. And he's a very well-educated fellow. You know, he got his law degree from what was then Memphis State. And he's, he's no slouch in the intellect department. He's from our part of the world. Yes, he is. He's an <laughs> old boy. And speaking of our part of the world, I uh, wanted to uh, wrap up today with Filthy Rich. Yeah. Uh, the show that just got picked up uh, for series for the fall by Fox. Mark Wood. Uh, tell us what it, what it is. Um, I play the patriarch of uh, a family of well, for lack of a better word, televangelist, but they've started this sort of Christian empire. And the original premise is the patriarch of the family is killed in a plane crash. And uh, it comes about that he has three illegitimate children that he's cut into the will unbeknownst to anybody. And now the fight begins over the dividing the spoils of this empire that's been created. And who plays your wife? Kim Cattrall, and she's just a delight. That's going to be a great pairing. I think it will. I think it will. Um, I just adored working with her. I didn't get to do that much with her in the pilot itself. But what I did was just spectacular. And an odd coincidence, the first day of work on the pilot, the first scenes that we were shooting, were done in the theater where I started my career 52 years ago. Isn't that wild? It was just bizarre. So the show is set in the Deep South. Yeah. And, and, and the tele, in the televangelist sort of world. Yes. That's uh, not going to step on any toes. No, not, not <laughs> any at all. No, that won't offend anyone. Well, Gerald, thank you so much. Good luck uh, with another Emmy round. You've had two in a row. We need to make it three. Okay. Your lips to God's ears. All right. Thank you. You bet.